My name is Regina Strauss and I represent the Regional Office for Africa of UN Habitat. Today's session on the topic of urban resilience in member states of the Southern African Development Community, or SADEC, promises to be very engaging as we are fortunate to have a panel of distinguished speakers who all have unique insights on the issue. Before we dive into the discussion, I would like to start with a brief presentation to provide a background for today's event. Since 2018, UN Habitat has been partnering with the World Bank, SADEC, and the Technical Center for Disaster Risk Management, Sustainability and Urban Resilience, otherwise known as DIMSOR, to implement an initiative that is aimed at building the resilience of urban areas in the 16 SADEC member states. The work that is the basis and inspiration for our discussion today is made possible by funding from the ACPEU, managed by GFDRR, the World Bank. UN Habitat's assignment within this program over the past two years has two main components. On the one hand, the normative part is a research piece culminating in a report on urban vulnerability and resilience in the SADC region. On the other hand, the more practical component has been the implementation of a participatory planning methodology through a tool that we call the City Resilience Action Planning Tool, or CityRAP. In this presentation, I will quickly summarize some of the main findings of the research that is captured in the Regional Assessment Report. This will be published in early 2021 and some of the key takeaways from implementing CityRAP in cities of the SADC region. A more detailed analysis of all of these outcomes is articulated in a discussion paper that was prepared as input to today's session and which is available to you. We will put it in the chat box. So let's dive in. If we could have the presentation, please. So the regional assessment report is based on desk research, analysis of maps, risk profiling, and data collected from surveys conducted with all 16 SADC member states and the SADC DRR unit. It drills down into four levels, from the global to the city, with emphasis on the SADC regional level. I will try to quickly convey some of the findings. Next slide. At the crux of the regional assessment are the triple occurrences of rapid and uncontrolled urbanization, worsening effects of climate change and existing socioeconomic vulnerabilities. Coupled with the fact that the region is highly prone to hazards such as cyclones, floods and droughts, this makes for an enormous challenge which must be addressed at all levels from the local to the regional. The data on urbanization also shows an interesting trend. Urbanization in Africa has two distinct tracks. On the one hand, we are seeing the blossoming of megacities such as Dar es Salaam and Luanda. And on the other hand, we see that the majority of the region's urban population live in smaller secondary cities, which are taking on increasing importance as shifting populations from megacities to secondary cities comes with many socioeconomic benefits. That said, addressing the urban resilience needs of megacities versus smaller secondary cities cannot be handled the same way. What is common, however, is that if urbanization is left unplanned, urbanization is jeopardized. Next slide. As you can see from this slide, another important point is that since most natural hazards are transboundary, the case for intercountry cooperation is well evidenced. It is essential that countries and cities that share the same hazards, for example, the cluster of coastal and island states that are visited by cyclones annually, share information, knowledge, experiences, and coordinate and cooperate at the policy and strategic levels as well. This is not only limited to reducing disaster risk, but also to addressing the root causes of the climate change effects that are intensifying hazards and working towards longer term urban resilience. Next slide. There is an entire chapter of the regional assessment report dedicated to institutional and policy analysis focused on the SADC regional level, but housed within the global framework and with consideration to the need for integrating the national and city level plans and strategies as well. The main message here is that a lot of the groundwork has already been laid. There are regional, national and city mechanisms in place, but there are still many gaps and weaknesses, especially relating to vertical coordination between levels of governance and thematic silos that have not yet achieved a cross-cutting approach to DRR and climate change. Next slide. The key findings of the report are divided into these six main areas, which you see on the screen. There's a lot to unpack and the discussion paper and the final version of the report do so. 
There you can find additional details and examples for all these dimensions and the recommendations that flow from them. A lot of these areas will also be touched upon in our discussion today. Next slide. So I can talk about CityRAP for days, but I only have a few seconds left. So let me emphasize that this is a tool designed particularly for small and intermediate sized cities and it brings together city leadership and communities to enable them to identify the city's key resilience building needs together. The outcome is an easily fundable and executable plan. We have already tested and implemented CityRap in 34 locations in 12 African countries. And through this initiative, we covered eight cities. For example, the city of Mutara, whose town clerk is with us today. We have learned a lot from CityRap implementation, both about participatory resilience planning and about some of the key trends related to urban resilience in the region. But in general, our observations from the CityRap experience have reinforced our research findings articulated in the regional assessment. Next slide. And then of course we get to COVID, the enormous shock that has rattled our existence this year. While the pandemic has created a dangerous multi-tiered risk scenario in the, in the region and put cities at its epicenter, we also see a silver lining. COVID-19 highlights the same existing gaps that the regional assessment identified. If these gaps are tackled as a result of COVID, it would also build resilience to other hazards. Hopefully we can use the coronavirus experience to motivate further African cities to holistically tackle their vulnerabilities innovate and transform to greener, safer, more prosperous and more resilient urban areas. Next slide. In conclusion, we have produced a solid evidence base from our research and practical work with cities that makes a strong claim for learning from homegrown best practices for urban resilience building at different city scales and for a coordinated multi-country approach that encapsulates and goes beyond local, national and sectoral boundaries. As you can see on the screen, these, these three points are the aims of the session and the points that we are going to ask our speakers to concentrate on. So thank you for bearing with me. This was just a glimpse into our work that we would like to share with you in more detail through our forthcoming report. Our speakers today will reflect on some of the key issues raised and provide you with a more direct view into these opportunities and challenges in the region. And now let's jump into our discussion. Please allow me to introduce our moderator, my colleague at UN Habitat, and the brains behind much of this work, Mr. Matias Paliviero. Matias, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Frugina. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So I'll be the moderator, and uh, I would like to ask each speaker to uh, fit to the seven minutes each uh, for this first session of dialogue with the mayors and the city leaders on innovation for building urban resilience. So my first question is to Ms. Mordin Siti Faruata, governor of the Grand Comor Island uh, of the Union of Comoros. Uh, Ms. Faruata, can you please, uh, you know that climate change and urbanization are closely interlinked and can manifest in both positive and negative outcomes. How can cities leverage their strength to adapt more effectively to climate change and prevent disasters? Can you please share some lessons learned from Grand Comor Island, which faces a very particular set of hazards and vulnerabilities? Ms. Farwata, the floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le Président, de me donner la parole. Thank you, moderator, for giving me the floor. I am pleased and honored to participate today at this regional forum to discuss such a crucial topic regarding concerning cities. I take this opportunity to warmly uh, greet my colleagues from Mozambique, Malawi and Madagascar, as well as our partners from UN Habitat uh, with Tim Su and SADEC that have left no stone unturned to strengthen the resilience of our cities when tackling disasters and climate change. Before I get into the crux of the matter, allow me to give you an overview of the issue of resilience in our city, Moroni, the capital, is addressing the challenge of climate change. The city of Moroni has to deal with an uh, unplanned 
uh, rapid growth of the population that enhances significantly the vulnerability to climate change and uh, disaster risk. Its population has more than tripled over the last 30 years and Moroni is facing a massive and unplanned uh, rural exodus uh, in the absence of a real urban planning strategy. To that is the lack of uh, adequate planning of uh, ad proper infrastructure to deal with this population growth, as well as management of waste, drains, and supply of clean water. We, we can also note that the city of Moroni is highly exposed to coastal erosion and cyclone impacts enhanced by the effect of uh, climate change. It is constantly exposed to the effects of the Kartala uh, volcano, which is still active and eruptions can le lead to massive disruptions of socioeconomic activities of the cities. The early eruptions swallowed over 40% of the land area of the capital. And, and this was due to the lava flow. However, there is a positive side to the story. The city has a major asset in terms of organization related to the dense and well-developed uh, social fabric around neighborhoods and villages. The intervening structures in the area of adaptation, waste management, improving drainage and reforestation, and uh, replanning of streets to facilitate mobility, access and creation of public space for leisure and the construction of cultural centers for uh, leisure. On this latter point, I want to share with you the experience of the engagement of my community on uh, urban resilience. Indeed, the unplanned development of the city and the lack of uh, planning resulted in problems of access in the neighborhood because of the absence of uh, smaller roads and the degradation of these roads. To address this uh, lack of uh, intervention by the various public services, the communities organized themselves into associations, development associations in their respective neighborhoods to have development projects and to strengthen resilience, particularly. Many of these initiatives focused on uh, the development of uh, roads and smaller roads to facilitate access, but also to improve the drainage of rainwater. Various forms of uh, uh, fundraising can be organized in the respective neighborhoods. Generally speaking, in the form of cultural manifestations and collection of grants and donations. This can be done and this can be achieved through uh, awareness raising by the community, targeting its community members and various professional categories that are operating in the respective neighborhoods of the city. The funds those collected uh, are earmarked for the purchase of uh, equipment, labor and expertise provided uh, willingly uh, on a voluntary basis by the members of the community. However, the achievement of these various infrastructure uh, produced uh, results contrary to what was expected because their design and construction did not factor in water drainage, the lack of appropriate expertise, uh, feasibility study, and monitoring of implementation. We also have the planning and implementation of dikes that were affected by uh, some uh, uh, climate uh, effects. I would have also loved through this discussion to, to have a workshop that will permit us to take advantage of our shared experience and uh, lessons learned. Now, while being understood that the policies are in the Como Emergence Strategy initiated by the president of Comoros, this is an innovative project that is part of uh, city resilience. I thank you for your attention. Keeping the time and for explaining the multiple challenges uh, faced by the Grand Como, but also, as you said, 
uh, uh, some of the opportunities based on community uh, solidarity and uh, a great work on, 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 on resilience building. Uh, let me go now pass to the next speaker, uh, Mr. Joshua Maligua, who is the town clerk for the city of Mutare in Zimbabwe. Mr. Maligua, uh, how has the city of Mutare succeeded in improving the coping capacity of local populations through participation, awareness raising, training and education? What step have you, take, have you taken to build your city's resilience in a participatory manner? Mr. Maligua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matthias. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A good welcome from Tari City Council. If, if we can have the, if we can share the screen, please, from our technical guys. Ismail, if we can share the screen with, with, so that we can start the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank there, you very much. There is coming. Yes. 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 Okay. First screen. Let's go to. That's the first screen. Let's yes. Let's go to the next six. That's the framework. Yes. The introduction. City of Mutare is lucky to be part of the city rap approach process. City rap approach process. As we well heard, the city rap process is a participatory resilience planning process where the city engages its uh, residents to deal with issues to do with uh, disaster and sustainable issues within the city. So through the CITRAP uh, tool developed uh, by the UN and the Technical Co Center for Disaster Resilience Management, Sustainable and Urban Resilience, Mutare has crafted a, a resilience framework of action, which is called an RFA. And the resilience framework for action is set of a priority, priority areas and action plans to be implemented in order to build resilience at the city level. And this RFA can be incorporated into council policies, plans, programs for current and for the future budgets. And the city is excited to note that this has been quite a success and most of our policies and programs are now in line with the, with the uh, resilience framework for action. It must be uh, important to also to learn from the city lessons from the city process. What is for the community without the community is for is not for the community. That is important. This is what we learned from what from the processes of participatory which have been engaging during the city process. Residents were saying, what is for the community without the community is not for the community. Hence the need for a participatory approach. So the community was involved in mapping communities, uh, knowing their vulnerabilities and priority requirements. They were also involved in the assessment in the, in, in the critical, uh, where, what is critical for the cities, to the internal structures, towards implementing. And also they were focusing, there were a lot of focus groups that were internally or externally that were also involved in the city and committing mapping processes. There was also a validation workshop which was there for all the stakeholders within the city to discuss issues to do with the resilience, to discuss issues to do with the disasters, and also to discuss issues to do with, with the building resilience within our cities. We also touched on issues to do on inclusivity, which is very critical and vital. We had women, we had children, we had youths, we had people living with disabilities, we had residents, we had business people. They were also involved in the city process. Let's go to the next one. That is the screen which shows how the, uh, the mapping process, the risk mapping was done within the city by, of some of the vulnerable communities under the city program which is Sakuba, that's one area which is a high, highly populated area called Sakuba. There is also a densely populated area called Zimta and also an illegal um, uh, settlement called Mahalape. These are the frameworks which uh, some of the risk areas that have been done by the stakeholders during the community mapping processes. If you can move on. From the city, a rap process and from the community mapping, it came out that from words and plans to action, it, we must not only talk, we must actually walk the talk. We should seize 
and stop from the, 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 the habit of simply talking, but we should actually walk the talk. This is actually evidenced through the cities program when we were now introducing programs and projects that are, were actually being derived from the resilience framework for action. The city has enhanced its resilience activities through improved service delivery as evidenced by the provisions of solar uh, street lighting uh, and high mast towers in communities to enhance public safety. During the city mapping processes, it came out from the residents, mostly women and children, that most there are some areas within the city that were dark, that were not light, and they were posing risks to our residents. Hence, we started now coming up with the solar uh, projects within the city. We also improved on waste management so as to ensure that we have got a, a healthy uh, community. We also started to improve more on on, on health services where we introduced malaria control programs. We were also very much vivid in terms of controlling the citywide COVID-19 interventions through the construction and renovation of primary health care facilities, as well as the renovation of the Mutare Infectious Disease Hospital. We also provided the clean potable water through the Tangamura pipeline project, drilling of community boreholes, supplementary water supply, and programs via bowsers. This was actually derived from the city uh, true processes through the resilience framework for action. We can move on. Pro resilience participatory budgeting. Pro, uh, pro participatory budgeting is quite critical when we're dealing with the city process. It is important that what is for the community can only engage and can only be involved if they are involved in the uh, participating in that kind of a budget. So the city of Mutare, the, the, the privilege of uh, coming up with the, what we call participatory budgeting via what we call program-based budgeting, which involved training and education of residents regarding what-based budgeting, inclusive budgeting incorporating input of what development committees, participatory budgeting capacity building initiatives where residents were encouraged to, to pay up their rates on time so that we have what we call water retention funds that will be used to also boost projects and programs within the, those particular wards. We, we also dealt with what we call collaborative development where the city has various the memorandum of understanding with the residents' representatives, uh, which is UMRAT, such as UMRAT regarding participatory budgeting initiatives, and also ensuring that we involve children, women, and youths in, in the municipal budgeting programs. Forward-looking and visionary resilience planning. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is important to align uh, to, to understand the alignment of all city plans within the imperatives of resilience. The new city plan, the master plan, was also uh, effected and is now pending approval with, at our ministerial level. The city policies and bylaws, including climate change and environmental policies, were also adopted, wherein through the, the, through the, through the process of the city pro program, and we were also involved in the adoption of the LIP which we call local environment action plans. The, we also instituted for a water and storage infrastructure master plan, ensuring that resources of water uh, to meet its growth and the water demands by 2030. We also set up a dedicated resilience desk within the city where residents, where key stakeholders would come and share their views, their opinion, and how we should be dealing with the resilience issues within the city. We have also developed what we call collaborative initiatives within our cities, where we visited the George municipalities, courtesy of um, UN Habitat in South Africa, where we also discussed at length on how to deal with the city process and other resilience, urban resilience challenges. Gender mainstreaming is, was also an issue which was at this epicenter of our discussions. And critically, we also noted the need for, in, for increase and improvement of our local environments. We can move on. Uh, we have to wrap up, uh, Mr. Malingwa. 
Yes, I think we can proceed. That is the indicator indication which shows where we are supposed to be moving. That is also an indication where what is for us without us is not for us from the discussions which have been done and we have been discussing, that is me and the senior government officials and also a UN habitat official, they are discussing about issues. Conclusion, there is a need for us to have teamwork, participation, dedication, initiative, cooperation, coordination, excellence, vision, foresight, and inclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Malingua. Uh, this is really impressive work uh, and quite impressive how you managed to put the people in front of the process and you yes. as a city leader uh, have been managing that process. So without any due, uh, the next speaker is Ms. Alice Russo Matsapa, uh, Town Council Chairperson in Iswatini. Uh, uh, Ms. Russo, can you please share and reflect on lessons from Matsapa City pioneering effort on building resilience in urban areas, innovative approaches to climate change adaptation and disaster risk management. How have, you, how have partnerships between the city and the national level supported this process? Ms. Russo, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Th thank you so much. Um, uh, as has been before, I'm, I'm standing in with, with Ms. Russo next to me for, for some reasons uh, of, of uh, alignment of uh, elements here. Uh, just to, to say uh, it, the, the problem is we, we, we take this opportunity very serious as Matsapa. We are in an industrial town for, this, uh, for the whole country. So, so what happens is our problem of uh, climate uh, risk uh, or disaster risk issues is actually a national concern. So for us, it, is, it has been a positive thing to actually partner with the National Emergency uh, the Disaster Management Agency because for one reason is uh, we are solving a national problem, not a localized problem. So uh, that will, will then help in terms of resources for to conducting that uh, disaster risk uh, studies. So that is one uh, assignment that we, we then had to do together with the uh, total uh, no, national uh, disaster management agency. On a similar note, um, we, we have had to uh, be ahead or be the pioneer of a project wherein the, the whole country has to be planting about 10 million trees in the whole um, um, uh, uh, country for the next five years. What we have done there, we, 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 uh, we had the prime minister to come and launch that, that event in our municipality, which, which now uh, put, put us on the, uh, the front side in terms of the first, first people, the pioneers of the event. So the whole country is going to start doing the, the, the so-called climate uh, mitigation uh, initiatives based on that project because it has got the approval from the head of governance in the country. Allow me to actually show, also explain that we've already done um, about uh, five more projects uh, still coming from the similar project of disaster risk uh, management. One of them is to look at the traffic management issues. Matapa is about over 700 uh, business outlets. And then, then it's also a national hub or where we keep the fuel for the whole country in terms of the one that is used by vehicles. So what happens is we have a problem of traffic. So what we've discovered now is, is, is we have to start projects that will have to alleviate the challenge of uh, traffic uh, congestion in the town. Because in a case of a disaster, if you have a problem of the easy flow of traffic and then you have a problem now that there's a disaster occurring, there, should be, there, there could be no route of escaping if you already have a problem of traffic management. That's one project we're already initiating. Also, we, we conduct... Um, uh, a five-year uh, state of environment reporting, which specifically checks the quality of the air we have at the time, and so that we can be in a position to start saying, okay, now, what is the profile in terms of the atmosphere, so that we can have targeted uh, mitigation measures, and that gives us a, mon a method of monitoring the trends. We also have a project that we are doing now that is looking at uh, what we call waste to energy. Uh, Matapa is one that harvests um, the, the highest um, uh, quality, quantities of waste uh, uh, per day in the whole country. And we have a problem of power in the country. Uh, most of 80% of our power comes from our neighbor, South Africa. So we are now starting a project where we'll be generating wa uh, energy from waste. And this project also has been pioneered by the same mitigations from the, risk, uh, from the disaster risk agency that we did when we started the program. We are also encouraging um, our industries to, to do what we call off-grid um, uh, re renewable energy plants.
act. For an example, um, that will offset 40% for uh, reliance on the national uh, grid. So you find that people will start solar generation um, uh, plants within their yard. We, as, as a town, will be the ones that are coming to actually say, yes, this is what we are supporting, and we will support that uh, even in the national regulator to support such initiatives. The last thing that we are doing is the, the country as a whole is we, we don't have what we call a, a hazardous waste management uh, a landfill or disposal site. So what happens most of the industries in the country we, we, which we, ha we, we, ha we house as a municipality will be the ones that are traveling to South Africa to actually through the, 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 the Basel Convention to, to dispose waste there. What we do as a, as, as a town now, we are at advanced stage where we are building now a transfer station where we are, everyone in the country must bring their hazardous waste into one point so that we reduce the traffic and, and the, 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 the traffic of moving up and down to South Africa, coming back to the country, so that it can come in one consignment. Then when it's being shipped, it's also a great, um, in terms of emissions, we've uh, stopped the number of traffic cars moving up and down. Just have one consignment under one house, then you can be able to ship it in, in set, set, certain times. So basically, um, uh, within, uh, without wasting a, a lot of time, I will say this is the benefits that I've had. And I think uh, this is my, I've just concluded. Thank you. Thank you so much also for, for keeping time uh, to the head of uh, the Environment Department standing for Ms. Russo. I think uh, uh, several challenges for the city, but I can see the proactivity in addressing them uh, in a very sustainable way and especially in coordination with national authorities. Let's now zoom out and, uh, and see also from national authorities relate, uh, regarding a regional approach to urban resilience uh, in Southern Africa and for the four countries they are represented in particular. The first speaker is uh, uh, Director Antonio Beleza, who is a Deputy Director for the Center of Emergency Operations Center in Mozambique. Mr. Beleza, uh, the question is the following. Is there a need for a regional approach, according to you, to building urban resilience? And if yes, how can this be facilitated to ensure that, that cities benefit from it? Or is urban resilience best left to the cities themselves? Mr. Beleza, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, and um, uh, you and Habitat for organizing this dialogue. Uh, the straight answer for your question, Matthias, is yes. I personally, I personally believe that a regional approach to urban resilience could deliver an integrated based model to support decision making in cross border regions facing disasters. And this is why uh, the Southern African region faces more common challenges and vulnerability with what uh, regards to urban, urban resilience. Mozambique is a rural country out of 25, 26 million population. Uh, I mean, out, out of almost 26 million population, 31.9% 30, of its population live in urban, uh, urban areas. The urban population is growing by three. 3.3% per year, while the country's overall average is 2.5. It is projected that uh, by 2040, uh, around 40% of the population will live in cities. The current uh, urbanization rate is 3.8%, and the main drivers of Mozamb Mozambican urbanization are natural population growth, which is 2.4, and rural urban migration, which is uh, 1.6. The search for jobs is also a key driver of urbanization, with more young people looking for employment uh, beyond agriculture, along with access to public services, which are mostly available in urban areas. In certain cases, uh, security is still a factor as well. So urban areas continue to be characterized by an extensive uh, lack of infrastructure and a public service and the majority of residents, we're talking about 70 to 80%, con continue to live in poorly serve, served informal settlements. So this scenario is reflects a, a commonality in, in the Southern African region, as Mozambique is not an exemption. Climate change presents numerous challenges, but as well as opportunities in, this, uh, in, the, con in the urban context. The human dimensions of climate change, especially its impacts on the daily challenges of the urban poor in terms of employment, livelihoods, safety, health, housing, and access to basic service 
are critical for successful policies to create inclusive and resilient, resilient cities. The current thinking of regional resilience is dominated by an isolated approach, which is based on uh, resilience being primarily uh, focused on isolated cities or countries, therefore neglecting critical influences of regi regional uh, urban systems. So my view is that disaster management and urban resilience of cross-border regions should be interconnected to address climate change related risks and vulnerabilities in cross-border countries, adopting a holistic perspective on these vulnerabilities and their management when a, when a disaster strikes. Recently, the southern region of Africa was hit by major cyclones, Idai and Kenneth in such intensity, intensity nev, never experienced before, causing one of, or one of the highest disasters in history. It is clear that a comprehensive approach to cross-border urban resilience is needed, as well as regional approach to build urban climate resilience in the most vulnerable settlements. So the relevance of this approach is already, already reflected through the sub-regional technical center for disaster risk management sustainability and urban resilience, the DIMSUR, and its, and its initiative is in building and strengthening uh, urban resilience in sub-Saharan -sub -sub African region, which relies on integrated approach for resilience, building the vulnerable cities. Thank you, Matthias, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Beleza. Uh, we we have tried to catch up with time. I think your, your statement is very clear, uh, and thank you. The next speaker is uh, uh, the Commissioner for Disaster Management Affairs uh, of Malawi, Mr. James uh, Shusiwa. Uh, uh, James, uh, how can the urban dimension of disaster be more sufficiently reflected in regional policy strategies and plans of action? A bit. Uh, following what uh, Director Beleza was saying. Where are, according to you, the major financing gaps for disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, especially considering the urban dimension in the SADC region, and how can these be overcome through enhanced regional coordination? James, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, uh, Matthias, for uh, those two uh, questions. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the uh, urban uh, dimensions being reflected in uh, regional policies and uh, uh, strategies, I feel that uh, the process of ensuring that uh, regional policies, uh, strategies, and plans adequately reflect uh, urban dimensions of disasters ought to start at the country level, uh, where member states should drive this process uh, by ensuring that uh, they have appropriate national instruments to facilitate integration of uh, urban dimensions of uh, uh, disasters. When it starts from there, then it's like it will be easy, you know, so like to move it uh, to the regional level. As a region, uh, we have made progress in developing policy instruments to guide this process, uh, such as the ASADIC Regional uh, Resilience Framework, 2020-2030, uh, uh, which makes deliberate effort uh, to consider urban uh, dimensions of resilience. This framework was approved by uh, SADC ministers responsible for disaster risk management in February this year. I feel that what remains now is ensuring that uh, these issues are integrated into other regional frameworks and strategies, as well as ensuring that member states align their frameworks and strategies to, uh, to the regional uh, framework. We also need to review some of the uh, instruments and processes we use in assessing hazards, vulnerability, and disaster impacts. I have in mind the regional and national vulnerability assessment framework for food security, which is still skewed uh, towards rural areas, when in fact food insecurity is also a problem in peri-urban areas. It is therefore high time uh, these assessments also covered uh, urban uh, areas. And to go to uh, the issue of major uh, financing gaps uh, for DRR and uh, climate change adaptation, I see that a common trend among 
uh, most member states in SADC is uh, low government allocation of funds towards building resilience. So I strongly feel that uh, we cannot make any progress if you are not able to fund resilience efforts from our own budgets as governments. So this ought to be a key focus area uh, before we even start exploring external uh, financing. And the other issue is the limited focus on uh, alternative financing mechanisms. For instance, while risk transfer mechanisms exist in the region through the African Risk Capacity Initiative, very few countries have taken this path. What is even more worrying is the fact that at country level, the extent uh, to which the insurance industry considers uh, catastrophic insurance related to disasters is very limited and where it exists, this has been often driven by projects and not uh, at the industry itself. So I feel that the, the ARC uh, needs to do more sensitization of member states about uh, the initiative. I think in the interest of time, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. I think uh, uh, you are touched on, on very important points, especially the issue of finance. And uh, I cannot agree more with you on the, on the need to have a, a, a local own, own source uh, financing and of course also the insurance system to be strengthened. So without further ado, uh, uh, the last speaker for this session is Professor Dewald van Niekerk. Uh, from Northwest University, South Africa. Dear world, it's always a pleasure to have you. The question is, uh, how can stakeholders such as academia and academic networks support further advancing the nexus between disaster risk reduction, development, and climate change adaptation, and the development of a regional body of knowledge and expertise to tackle urban risks and to identify and implement concrete solutions? Dear world, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, um, colleagues. It's uh, always a pleasure to be in a, a discussion like this. Um, first of all, I think the resilience building and urban risk nexus is one of the most important things going into development in the future for the SADC region. Um, it is one of those or two of those areas that brings together a multitude of, of various disciplines and also tries to address quite a number of, of common issues. And therefore, I'm quite excited that we've, we've progressed in the past 20 years to reach a point where we can use the resilience as a focal point to bring together quite a number of, of different disciplines and people focusing on this world, real world problem that we have. That being said, what the academic research environment can do in order to support, I think there's, there's three major points um, that I want to, to capture. The first is obviously the inherent nature of universities and research institutions. Um, also, then um, the partnerships, which is, is very important. And the last one that I want to highlight is um, anticipatory governance, which is a much more broader focus. So, in terms of, of what universities do, is obviously we do research, um, we do capacity development in terms of training, education, we do community outreach. So, what I found in the past, and DIMSA is, is a very good example of this, and, and certainly my center and a few others around SADC is. Um, that they were born out of a, a common problem that we've identified, either being disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, or urban issues. Um, and therefore, the research component is very close to my heart, and I, I believe this is where universities can play a major role. That being said, in terms of research, we need to have a longitudinal research agenda that is driven by our member states. Um, researchers sit around literally looking for problems to investigate. And if we can do this through identifying real world problems, that is a multiple gain for, for many of us. Um, I would like to caution about what I've, the recent trend that I've seen in the region is that there's a lot of funding for short term projects. And um, that is, uh, you know, two months projects does not necessarily address the issue. And therefore, I would urge for much more longitudinal research projects. That links up with partnerships. Universities are in an ideal situation to link up multiple partners. I mean, universities have been around much longer than any government. Um, and therefore, for um, public institutions, even private institutions, to work with universities uh, will give us much more longer term gains. We can engage in mentoring and internship programs where we can also learn from industry. And we then train those cater of 
um, students that can go into the future and occupy these positions and provide the solutions that we seek. And the lastly, in terms of anticipatory governance, I want to leave this with our urban centers. And this is uh, a proposal to investigate how we can use this concept of anticipatory governance going into the future, which will allow us more foresight, more uh, um, open-minded institutional culture. And this one, especially for Carl, is aftragstetic. And that means that there's a way, a better way of trusting people in lower ranks of government um, to make decisions and feed that into an academic system as well that will lead to much better problem solving. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dewald. I think uh, there is no doubt of the important uh, role played uh, by the academia and the research in all of this because we need evidence uh, for all these strategies that were discussed and exposed uh, both at local and national and even regional level. And uh, I cannot agree more on, on, on the issue of anti anticipatory governance and, and the partnership building and the fact that we should avoid uh, depending on projects and have a more institutionalized setup. So we are getting to the conclusion of this session and uh, I would like to now pass the floor to, to Carl Dingle uh, from the World Bank, the, the program manager of this initiative uh, uh, for the wrap up and closing. Uh, Carl. Uh, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Matthias, uh, for for um, giving the floor to me for a few closing remarks. Um, I work uh, on coordinating our our programs and initiatives with the on disaster risk management with the regional economic communities in Africa. To not, uh, this morning, I won't make a big statement, nor will I speak really officially, but I just want to reflect a bit on what the different speakers, the mayors, the professors, and you know, experts from the region have, 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 um, have presented, and um, also provide a bit more background on the larger program, the ACP EU program on building disaster resilience in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, discussing the role of cities in response to the COVID pandemic, cities and climate change, cities and, and um, addressing disasters, I think that, that would uh, request a whole conference itself. Um, just to reflect a bit more on, on what the speakers and I think we had a number of very good um, you know, reflections this morning on the work you have been doing in the region. If you look at the 470 million people who are in, already living in, in cities in Africa and Africa as the you know, as the fastest urbanizing continent, we see the, how to call it, the, the real, the urgency of, of addressing this issue. Southern Africa which it has two of the largest um, urban areas in the region, Kinshasa in DRC, as well as the Gauteng, uh, meaning Pretoria, Johannesburg areas. As cities are, you know, rapidly urbanizing, much of this um, is often happening as we, as it has been discussed this morning in, in a bit of an and without proper risk averse planning, without taking future and current risk into account. So for example, you know, and, and, and often phrased uh, example, it's as cities are, as communities are moving to the city, um, they are settling in areas which are at risk of flooding, essentially, you know, wherever there's, um, there's space available. At the same time, Southern Africa is also highly susceptible to the impacts of extreme climate events, in particular floods, droughts um, and cyclone and um, you now we we can we have seen that with the with the cyclone I die which has affected uh, the regions heavily um, in in 2019 and um, yeah we already I think one can already see trends of increasing frequency and severity in terms of um, extreme weather and climate events and nothing to mention about 2020 with the pandemic coming in with COVID um, cities were the, at the center of being affected, but cities are um, also um, what is also coming back in in the different um, in the in the different presentations and, and discussion points this morning at the forefront um, on taking actions. I think these are the mayors, the people on the front line, city workers um, are directly responding to citizens, to its inhabitants um, on the request for um, you know better planning. Um, addressing climate change, uh, having more de resilient development options on, and um, providing in, in this year, in 2020, you know, the, 
the, the, the frontline response to the COVID-19 pandemic and building back better. So cities in the region do not do also share some of those com commonalities um, on, and I think it would be interesting to see uh, how these initiatives and um, I heard the colleagues speaking that there is indeed a, a need or some, some, some wish to have a closer regional coordination on this. Um, with this, um, um, I think it's good to, to get that perspective on and um, before closing I want to get back a bit to our regional perspective to see uh, we've seen in the last couple of um, of, of years, uh, SADEC and other partners taking really a, a more leading role on coordinating preparedness, uh, coordinating disaster policies, bringing member states together. Some of this has been done through the ACP EU program uh, that, helped, that has helped uh, SADEC to work on its humanitarian um, and emergency operations centers, contingency planning, the disaster resilience policies. I think many of these things also have a really a relevance for, for the cities, for the local level. So before really coming to the final close of the session, I would take the opportunity to, to give one or two more sentences on the program. The, it's an initiative of the Africa Caribbean Pacific and implemented by the World Bank and uh, GFDR. It's going on since 2016 in the region. And um, yeah, it's, it's a part of a larger program which involves through its what we call result area two, all of the regional economic communities, ECOWAS in West Africa, ECAS in Central Africa, and IGAT in the Horn of Africa, and SADC in the, in the South. So with the, within the SADC region, the project supported um, different activities, as I said, on policy coordination, capacity building. We had a long and um, you know, successful collaboration, for example, with Northwest universities and training government officials, students, um, early researchers on different aspects on disaster risk management. Uh, we worked on, um, SADEG is working on its humanitarian operations center and information management platform. So all of these activities, um, um, you know, bring, bring the disaster management um, policies integration a step closer. Um, at the SADA conference in 2018, the participants expressed particularly this issue of cities, bringing them in. So I'm particularly thankful for UN Habitat's uh, DIMSUA Center to, you know, respond essentially through this project, to this initiative, and showing us, showing the, the, the cities in the region some some of the areas, some of the avenues to, to take this resilience building forward. I'm quickly looking at my watch and I see we are very much close to the end of the session. So I will not, you know, I will not elaborate much, much further, but I would like to thank uh, um, all of the speakers this, uh, this morning, um, the mayors, governors, the town clerks, the government colleagues, Professor Van Niekerk and others to, to come and share their experience. I'd like to thank uh, the UN Habitat, UN Habitat's Dim Source Center for, for organizing this session and doing you know, the, the technical work behind the scenes and bringing this analytical work forward. Um, so, and obviously all our nearly 50 participants who joined uh, this session this morning, a big thank you for joining in. And um, with that, I think I'm taking the opportunity to officially wrap it up here with. Thank everyone for zooming in this morning. And if you stay on, there are a couple of other interesting sessions on the uh, UR forum this morning. We are, I think today is the last day of the UR conference. So don't hesitate to join one of the other discussions. And thanks everyone for, for joining the sessions. And over to you. I'll have to my apologize as I have to no. run away to another session. Um, but again, thanks. And let me here with um, pass it back for and you know, on the closing of this. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. No, I think we are wrapping up, so we are just in time. Uh, I really thank for your words and also for the support for, of the World Bank uh, in this important initiative. Thank you all for listening, and hopefully uh, we will follow up this discussion uh, for the next years to come. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you.